Adams. Thank you. It's good to see everyone here. As you know, I'm the old guard on this <laughs> And old guards sometimes tend to ramble on talking about the good old days. So I decided that tonight, with your permission, I will read my prepared remarks so I stay on track and don't take away from your time. Microphone. I'll blast you then. Uh, <laughs> is, the, is this okay? Yeah. 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 Well, as they said, I came to Penn State to Happy Valley in 1954. As a new faculty member in our college at that time, it was called Physical Education, it was the School of Physical Education and Athletics. That was a long time ago. And it was back in the days when White Building was called White Hall. And it was also the center of all physical education and physical activity for women. Women, I stress that. This is on every door, entry door in white building. There was a note, men, do not enter. <laughs> 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 Marie Haight, who was then chair of women's physical education, was really concerned that men would take over this beautiful facility. So this is why she did this. <laughs> this was also the home of the Women's Recreation Association. This was a student organization. And it was usually called WRA for short. And this student organization sponsored the Women's Intramural Program as well, which scheduled you know, the competition between the dorms sororities, pick up teams, take your pick. And uh, it was also responsible for the sports club program. And this was to enhance skill levels in specific sports, as well as to provide competition within the membership of that. It was the WRA that sponsored the then popular play days and sports days. <laughs> Some of you may say, what's that? <laughs> because we sure don't have them today. But Penn State back in those days sponsored quite a few of these each year and invited three, four, or even five nearby colleges to bring a selected number of students or teams for a day of informal competition in a specific sport or sometimes facilities allowing in several sports. In play days, students from all of the colleges would be assigned to a team <clears throat> who didn't have a choice. And this was the, t you're on that team for all the competition of that day. A college did not compete as a team in play days. However, in sports days, colleges did compete as a team. And this was to the liking of a lot of people. Sometime during that day, of course, you always had to have cookies, ice cream, punch, <laughs> sometimes even a whole meal, depending. And these days of competition were really quite social, more social than competitive. In the late 50s, our Penn State gals, however, indicated their preference for the sports days over the play day. They wanted to be on their own Penn State team. This led them to ask the question, why don't we have a varsity sports program? This was the beginning of a very careful consideration by the women's faculty of the advantages, disadvantages of a varsity sports program. And this was in the early 60s. Since by this time I was head of women's physical education, I was deeply involved in, in this process. <clears throat> it should be noted that many women in this community, as well as on our faculty, were opposed to women competing, period. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that uh, this conversation went on for quite a few years. However, to make that a long story short, 
a plan for a varsity program for women at Penn State was designed. This included very stringent policies regarding scheduling. Very stringent policies about everything. <laughs> Today they are laughable, but then they were a means of getting the program started. Our plan was approved first by our faculty and then by our dean, Ernie McCoy at that time, and President Eric Walker. However, Dean McCoy and President Walker had one requested change. Call this program something other than the intercollegiate or varsity. So, when we suggested extramural, they said, good. People won't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so this is how it all began. <laughs> and in phasing in this program, it was understood that one, Della Durant, the head of WRA, would also have to be our first women's athletic director. Two, the advisors of all the sports clubs would automatically serve as team coaches for the first year. And as needed, faculty specializing in the sport in question would be hired not only as a coach, but as a faculty member in uh, instructor in physical education. Three, rather than budgeting for nine sets of team uniforms, uniforms that were already in supply, such as leotards for gymnastics and tunics for basketball, could be used for the first year at least. <laughs> we were handsomely dressed. <laughs> In the fall of 64, field hockey introduced our extramural programs by having contests with four different colleges <laughs> nearby, Pennsylvania colleges. Following hockey, in winter of 1965 of that academic year, were basketball, fencing, golf, gymnastics, lacrosse, softball, and tennis. So our program started long before Title IX was enacted in 1972. Excuse me. <coughs> this weather isn't good for a post-nasal drip, I think. <laughs> and all the years that I have been connected with this program, we have always had full support from our administration, even at the highest level. Dean McCoy typically brought President Walker with him to several contests each year. I remember well the first gymnastics meet that was with Springfield that he attended in White Building. I gasped as our team made its entrance. The gymnasts must have heard that the dean and the president were coming. <coughs> and they took advantage of this by wearing their oldest, most faded leader <laughs> <laughs> and also tights with runs in. <laughs> Although we didn't win that meet, our athletes did make their point. At the conclusion of this meet, Dr. Walker approached me to say, by 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, I wish to have a list of everything you need for gymnastics <laughs> in my office, and I will see that you get it. <laughs> this list was on his desk as requested, with a thank you note and invitation to attend any of our extramural contests. <laughs> our women's program has always had support, so we have been the envy of many colleagues. Furthermore, we have always been blessed with loyal fans. Title IX certainly helped us by providing us with more competition since more colleges started programs. And further, regional and national contests were initiated in the early 70s by our newly formed governing bodies, AIAW and EAIW. A number of these contests were held at Penn State, and this also gave us more recognition, both regionally and nationally. <clears throat> it should be noted that Penn State supported these organizations in many ways, and many of our faculty 
were instrumental in the formation of these groups. <clears throat> this member of the Old Guard is very proud of our women's program as it is today. We have come a long way doing the right thing. Yes, we are Penn State. No. <laughs> that uh, to Coquis that this lady right here played on the national basketball championship team. The first national basketball championship. Oh, good. Sushi. <laughs> you know, when I got the call uh, from Amy and then from Mary Jo, they said, talk about your playing experiences pre-Title IX, your high school experiences of teaching and coaching, and your experiences at Penn State. You have about 10 minutes and Mary Jo has a hook. <laughs> so, <laughs> Can everybody hear my gym voice without me? Okay. So I'll do my best. You know, I consider myself very, very fortunate years ago uh, because back in the late uh, 50s and early 60s, growing up in northern Delaware, uh, we played uh, CYO leagues. And uh, we had uniforms, we had coaches, and we played other teams. Now, to many of you in this room, CYO means Catholic Youth Organization. But to us, we took our sports, mainly the two we played at that time with softball and basketball, very, very seriously. To us, CYO meant crush your opponent. <laughs> and, and I still remember to this day going to our coach's house at night to learn plays on a little magnetic board, a little round disc that were our plays and our players. When I got to um, high school, I was very fortunate because we were in um, 63 to 65. We were in the Suburban League in Delaware. We played all the schools the men's teams did in Delaware. Um, we had coaches for all of our sports and, and we had uniforms. So it really wasn't until I got to college that I understood that this wasn't the way it was everywhere else. Um, even so to the point of when we played basketball in high school, we shared evenly the, the gym with the men. One week we'd go early and the next week they'd go early. And when you talk to people, they go, you're kidding. And I attribute that to the men and women who were responsible for the physical education program that they saw it as being equal and it was just the way I thought everybody did it. When I got to college, we were able to play three varsity sports. We didn't play a lot of games in each sport because you were busy getting ready then for the next sport. We didn't have leagues. We shared uniforms for multiple sports. And it wasn't until my senior year that the basketball coach at Westchester decided that it was time for a women's championship. And all uh, tribute and accolades go to Carol Ekman, who held and organized the first national invitational championship at Westchester for women's basketball. She invited uh, many of the top teams from around the country. And I think she even, we never really knew for sure, but I think she even footed the bill to make new, us new gold tunics. And we thought we were really hot stuff till we saw these other teams come in from other parts of the country in silk, stars, and stripes, and everything else. But Westchester went on to win that national championship. And I guess many of us playing on that team did not realize the impact of that championship at the time. <clears throat> We didn't know that Carol Ekman had been told that basically she had a little support from uh, Westchester's athletic department to put on the tournament. There were stories of reporters and even coaches who weren't allowed to use the phones in the athletic department. They had to run down the street, put money in the payphone, and call in the scores or report uh, what had happened back to their schools. And so we participated in something that to this day is probably bigger than any of us ever anticipated being at the time. When I graduated from uh, college, let me just jump back there for a minute. The one thing I do remember was at one of the semifinal games, I was standing upstairs with Mr. Reese, our athletic director, and we got over 2,000 people to come to that event each day. And he looked around and he looked down and he said to me, you know, I never thought this would be something that would draw spectators. <laughs> and he said, if we ever get to do it again, we'll do it right. Well, he never got the chance to do it again, but um, it just showed you the impact, and that was over 2,000 people that came to watch us. When I got out to teach, 
Uh, if you were a health and physical education teacher, you were sort of jack of all trades. Um, I taught 32 classes a week. We, I coached three varsity sports and did a gym show. It was just what was expected of you at the time. The other important factor is that most of the coaches at that time that worked, that were the head coaches or the assistant coaches, were employees of the school district. You weren't looking at national searches and all to bring in, in coaches. And we were fortunate in that there again uh, at Pencrest High School, we did play in a league. We did have championships. We did get trophies for teams that won. But another important factor that was happening around the same time was actions that were happening at Penn State University because at the same time, Penn State was reevaluating, as Marty said, their <laughs> athletic program. And I was fortunate at the time to have some outstanding women athletes who were the benefactors of some of the early scholarships to come to Penn State and to play field hockey and lacrosse. Some of you may remember the name Candy Finn, the Thompson sisters and all. And I, I found myself, anytime I had a free time on the weekend, coming up to watch them play. And I used to think to myself at the time, wow, you know, big school, this is really a cool place to be. But I also learned some things at the time in how the women were being treated here, and I felt that they were doing it the right way. So it made it easy for me when offers were coming to athletes that I was coaching at the high school level to pick a college. And we were fortunate enough that many of them did choose Penn State. Little did I know that I was going to be also one of the transplants <laughs> here. Um, in 1982, I took a sabbatical from Pencrest High School, fully intending to return when Jillian Rattray, the coach of the field hockey and lacrosse team, needed an assistant. Um, I got here and the story goes, I was able to get out of my sabbatical and never had to, to uh, return uh, to teach in the high school. I consider my years here um, at Penn State to be exceptional ones and I treasure all of them. I had the opportunity to be an assistant and head coach, an assistant and associate athletic director, and then senior women's administrators. You know, I did, as Marty said, you try and do things the right way. You can't get everything done at once, but you can get something done at once. And one of the biggest um, experiences I think I had here, and I know some women in this room got to experience too, was the 40th anniversary that we celebrated for women's athletics here. And during that celebration, we were able to give varsity letters to some of the women who came back who had never received a varsity letter that played here in the 60s. And seeing those women cry when they received the varsity letter was truly a very, very touching and meaningful moment um, as they got their varsity letter and they wore it with pride. You know, there were many firsts and I can remember our 1987 national championship team. I think that was the first one for the women here that, of an NCAA. We were now in the NCAA. And that team was the first team to get, women's team to get rings. Our 1989 team was the first women's team to be honored at the halftime of a football game. And I still remember the tears coming out of our players' eyes as 100,000 people stood up and applauded them. A very, very special and touching moment. A 2009 report that came out called the General Equity Scorecard, score and it was the fourth year that they had done this, ranked Penn State fourth nationally for outstanding women's programs. Um, we continue to make progress here um, with updating facilities, locker rooms, and, and budgets, but every time you, you know, there's always some more that you can do and, and, and moving in the right direction. When I was an administrator here, I had the opportunity to teach a, a class one class in the Cram Everything and there again in Title IX. And I was amazed um, at the number of students that really didn't understand what Title IX was or had misconceptions about Title IX. And before I began the class, I would give the students a test and it was just a quick, short question, answer true or false. And it was amazing to me the myths versus the facts of how they looked at, excuse me, at, of Title IX because many felt that Title IX was just athletics. And as many of you know, Title IX deals with every aspect of federally funded educational programs. And, and athletics is only one of 10 aspects that Title IX looks at. Many of them felt that it only was for women. 
So most people didn't know that it was for men and women, whichever was the underrepresented group. Title IX did not force schools to drop men's programs. That was not part of the law as they increased women's programs. And there was a study that came out in 2001 that showed that over 70, I think about 70, close to 75 percent of the schools that added women's sports at the time did not drop men's sports to accommodate their women's um, interest. Title IX does uh, not mean that sports must be treated equally. Uh, it does not mean that equal money must be spent on the men's and women's department. And it does not mean um, that coaches have to be paid equal salaries. As a matter of fact, Title IX does not deal with salaries, and I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and the only reason I know that is because when I was teaching high school, one of the things that we did do, uh, some of the women, we had to go before the Board of Trustees of the school because um, we did not feel we were getting pay equal to what we should in comparison to the men. And we had our data, we had our statistics, and some of the men were dumb enough to tell us what they were getting. So we had, we had information. And uh, fortunately for us, the, the board did make changes. Um, but we also were told that it wasn't Title, title IX. Has Title IX worked? You know, when I used to do this class here, I always looked up some statistics, so let me bore you with just a, a few that I pulled up of the newest ones that are out there. Uh, Title IX seems to be work working very well. According to recent data for colleges and universities, in 1972, fewer than 32,000 women played sports. They received less than 2% of the athletic budgets and no scholarships. Today, a record 193,300 women compete, six times the number since 1972. And progress has been made in all aspects, but there is still work to be done. One alarming figure to, to many women as they look at uh, comparison of men's and women's athletics in the country is the comparisons of Division I in the football bowl series, and that's the old 1A, which Penn State is part of. Those recent statistics show that women receive only still 28% of the total money spent in athletics, that 31% um, of recruiting dollars go to women, and that 42% of athletic scholarships go to women. For every dollar spent on women's athletics at the FBS, two and a half are spent still on men's athletics. With regards to high school, in 1972, 295,000 girls competed versus 3.67 3 million, 3 million boys. In 2010-11, 3.2 million girls were competing versus 4.5 million boys. But interestingly enough, for as much as you think you're getting ahead, Pennsylvania did not fare well in some of the high school studies. And it was showed that over 20% of the high schools were really way off when they looked at proportionality of girls and boys getting the opportunity to compete at the high school level. So still work to be done. Am I getting the hook yet? Or, 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 or. <laughs> I will stop there. I well, we'll, we'll you'll have a chance to ask questions. Um, speaking of litigation and uh, the law, Right here, we have an attorney <laughs> in Coquise, Washington. We know she's a Big Ten champion. We know she's a Sweet 16. Uh, but right now, she's... Well, they took everything I was going to say, so... Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, you know, it's, it's really amazing in, in a lot of ways that I'm sitting here because I, this, was, this was not my dream. Um, I grew up in the 1980s, middle school and high school, and I was fortunate that when I was in elementary school, I always knew I was gonna play high school sports. Um, I have two older sisters and they play, they're five and six years older than me, so when they were playing, I was you know, still, they let me be the ball girl and, <laughs> and, and hang out with them and you know, carry their dirty laundry and get them water, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> um, but I always expected to play in high school. And um, we, 
were fortunate enough that I now knowing that because of Title IX, you know, we got equal access to the gym and, you know, we, we got new uniforms and, and things of that nature. Um, and we've never felt like second class citizens. Now, I grew up at a time in Michigan where we played, um, the girls' basketball played in the fall and the boys' basketball played in the winter. So we ne never had to worry about competing for gym space. We actually got a lot of press because all the guys were playing football. The football only played once a week on Fridays, but we played on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we got a lot of coverage. We got a lot that, you know, the, the TV stations were out at our games. Um, you know, the newspaper always did write-ups on, on Wednesdays and Fridays about our, about our games. So that was, you know, that was pretty cool. We didn't have that balance. And I, or, or we didn't have to have that battle. And I was also fortunate because of Title IX that I fully expected to go to college for free. I fully expected to get a college scholarship and not have to worry about paying, paying for my education. As a matter of fact, I was um, really interested in going to Columbia University. And you know, I was like, I really like Columbia. I was all set. And then their coach said, and you're only going to have to pay about, and I was like, pay? <laughs> what? I'm not going to Columbia. You know, I'm going somewhere for free. But myself and, and um, a lot of, a lot of my, my club teammates you know, that were being recruited nationally, like it, was, it was no thought in our minds that we weren't going to go play in college and that we were going to have to pay for it, that we were going to get a scholarship, which was completely different. Um, than my sisters. You know, my sisters never thought about, you know, playing in college and, and getting a scholarship. Now, they were awful, so that may have something to do with it. <laughs> but that wasn't their, that, that wasn't what they thought about. Now, my older brother, who played football, you know, he fully expected and he did go to, go to college on a football scholarship. But I think that was something different, now in retrospect, looking back, that that, that was an expectation. Um, that I would go to college and I would get a scholarship. But my reality was I would go to college, I would play basketball, and that would pay for my degree, and then I'd be done playing basketball when college was over and you know, go, go get a job and do something, whatever that was. That's such a contrast to the kids that we coach now. Probably 90% of the girls that we recruit now fully expect to play professional basketball. Really? Yes. <laughs> all, of them, all of them think they're going pro. All of them think they're going to be the next superstar in the WNBA, and I don't have the heart to tell them. You know, only one of you is going. So. But, I mean, in contrast, we have a generation, the WNBA now is um, 16 years old. This is the 16th year. All of the kids that are growing up and all the kids that we're recruiting, they've now watched Lisa Leslie and Candace Parker and the WNBA. And, and their frame of reference is they, they want to play professionally, they want to be on TV and, comment, and be sports commentators and, and um, call the games, they want to be coaches. I never thought about having a career in athletics as, as a profession. So when I started off saying it's almost amazing that I'm here, I never thought that you could have a career as a coach, or you can have a career in athletics. For, for me and my generation, college, playing basketball in college was a means to an, an education, and then you go on and do something else. And now we have a generation of, of young girls who think and see college athletics, professional athletics as a profession. And they want to do that. And they, they come here to study and, and to participate in college sports fully expecting to, to stay in the game. That's one thing we hear. I want to stay involved in basketball. I want to stay involved in sports in some way, whether it's being, um, you know, a lot of them want to play, want to be commentators, but physical therapists, they want to go into sports medicine. They want to go into sports management. But sports now is, for, for this generation of girl, young ladies, girls, is a career now. And that's what I've seen in terms of the growth and the evolution of Title IX is, um, for me, it was opportunities to play. And for the next generation, you know, the next 40 years, it's going to be opportunities to lead, opportunities to make decisions, opportunities to be in positions to determine um, how those resources that, that are forced to be put into women's sports, how they're allocated. 
So that's been an, been an interesting journey and perspective um, that I've had with, with regard to Title IX. Mm. Thank you, co As many people don't realize, in fact, most probably, and I think this is a direct result of Title IX from an athletic standpoint, is that our women uh, win uh, consistently more medals uh, overall in the Olympic Games than our, than our men do. And that's, uh, I believe that has to be a direct result uh, of Title IX.